Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your mercy and all your blessings, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful funeral we had yesterday and just said, uh, thank you for that victory and for Rick's graduation into heaven. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord. We, again, lift up the various families around here with the two policemen who got to pass yesterday here in Cameron. Oh, Lord, be with our family today and the communities, too. But, Lord, this is a resurrection, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything you've done for us, for dying on the cross, and we thank you for your word. And help us as we look into the word and be a fresh word for our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, I'm going to take a little different approach to a resurrection message today than I generally uh, take. I generally just go through some of the, uh, one of the Gospels and the resurrection story there. Today I'm going to look at it through the life of Mary Magdalene. And uh, it may seem a little strange, but uh, I think uh, Mary Magdalene illustrates what happens uh, when a person follows Jesus. Their lives change. And for anybody that really has given their life to Jesus, their life changes. And if your life hasn't changed that much, maybe you better ask yourself why. Because that's what Jesus is in the process of doing, changing our lives. Not only saving us, but changing our lives and then uh, guiding us to the very point of where we uh, enter heaven and we, when we graduate. Anyway, I just thought I'd take Mary Magdalene today, but it's, you've got to take some background in it. And uh, we're going to kind of trace it through her life, but I want to hit the crucifixion and the resurrection. Because we don't really talk about the uh, crucifixion a whole lot sometimes because we jumped over Friday. We don't have a good Friday service, so uh, we, we generally uh, don't do that. But today I want to kind of emphasize it, all of it. And that's why the first songs were mainly from the crucifixion. The last songs we'll have this morning are more for the resurrection. So if you have a bulletin in the back, or on this, in the second page there, it talks about, it gives an outline. Number one, Mary was from Magdala. We're starting in Luke, the eighth chapter. Now, so read there the first couple verses in the eighth chapter. Soon afterwards, Jesus began the tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits, and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Mary, it says, was from Mag Magdala, Mary Magdalene, where Magdalene uh, meant that she was from Magdala. Now, Magdala was a little city just north of Tiberias, and uh, we don't know much about it except that she was from there. She's often the first woman that is speaking or spoken of when it talks about different women in the Bible. I think that's kind of interesting. Maybe we'll see a little bit later why that may be. Point number two, Mary was delivered of demons. We said that. Among them were Mary Magdalene, who, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Now, in Luke, the seventh chapter, just before this, right at the end of the seventh chapter, it talks about this immoral, sinful woman who comes and uh, anoints Jesus' uh, feet and uh, you know, washes or uses her hair and all this sort of stuff. And a lot of people jump to the conclusion, well, that must be Mary Magdalene. I, I've heard some tremendous messages by pastors saying that. And I think I've done that one or two times too, but if you really get right down to it, there's no indication, other than it's the next story down, that that was Mary Magdalene. We don't know. Generally, when it talks about Mary Magdalene, it uses her name. In this case, it just says a sinful woman. Uh, so I think we got to be careful when we're looking at Scripture that we don't jump to conclusions. I mentioned that last week, and that people jump to conclusions. I talked about that pastor who uh, uh, had this gossip in his congregation, and she was always telling stories about him and about everybody else in the congregation, and how he, uh, you know, she 
find something wrong with the pastor and just spread, oh, this is a prayer request. You know, we got to pray for our pastor. We got to pray for his family. You, you, I told that story last week. And finally, he cured her by uh, parking his car in front of her house all night one night. And she kind of shut up by all her stories. Anyway, uh, why I share that again is simply this we can look at scripture and jump to conclusions. Very easily, but not. Now, they may have been married, it may have, but it said cast out seven demons, which isn't that many when you think of the gathering guy. You know, he had a legion of demons, that's further on in the eighth chapter here. Uh, that could be up to 6,000 demons, okay? A legion could be up to 6,000, so he, he had lots of demons. It's kind of interesting that she got cast seven demons, only seven. Now, it said it might be. It might be the same woman. We don't know. Because you get involved in sexual immorality, you open yourself up to dem demonic oppression, possession, one thing or another. Anybody, young people that have been uh, molested when they're young, often have demonic influence in their life, maybe demon possession, demon demonized, because that trauma that happened at that time opens the door for the devil to come in. And sometimes people just can't get over that unless they absolutely forgive the person and ask Jesus to heal them and get rid of all that stuff. So if that's ever happened to any of you or anybody in line that's going to be listening, uh, you know, take it to Jesus. Forgive the person and take a stand against that divine thing. So I say it could be that, but it could be a lot of other things. Uh, she might have been sick, had some demon of infirmity. It talks about that in that very passage too. Uh, sometimes, not all sickness is going to be demonic by any means, but there definitely is demonic things that happen with diseases because in the Bible says Jesus uh, cast out the demon and healed the person. So sometimes it is. So just because someone's sick, don't think they necessarily have a demon, okay? Maybe it's depression. You know, some people just have all kinds of depression, and that can be and often is demonic. So what I'm saying here is she had seven demons cast out of her. And uh, if there's demons that influence your life, there's things that you can't control in your life, can't get victory in your life, take a story over. It's probably a demonic spirit that's got you bound in some way or another and doesn't want to let you go. But you've got authority because you belong to Jesus Christ. You live for him. He lives inside you. Greater is he that's in you than he's in the world. So you can take authority over it and get victory over it. And if you need help with someone agreeing with it, uh, fine, great, uh, you know, uh, get someone that loves the Lord uh, to agree with you. Okay? So what I'm saying is, Mary was delivered of some demons. Seven of them, in fact. And, uh, you know, I think she was always, always appreciative. Now, I'm going to read this passage again. The first three verses. And uh, I want to underscore something else. Soon afterwards, Jesus began the tour of the nearby towns and villages Preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God, he took the twelve disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, wife of Cusa, Herod's business manager, uh, Susanna, and others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. You know, in... Jewish society, women were never taught, okay? In, in fact, there's different things in the uh, old reading writings of the Hebrews that it, it was foolish to try to teach women, okay? And, uh, you know, you go to some synagogues today, men sit on one side, women on the other side. I mentioned a few weeks ago that I did in one, and the men sit on one side, women on the other, and us Gentiles were put in a totally different spot yet. The thing is that, uh, they, they thought it was foolish to try to teach women. Jesus broke that stereotype all down. Okay? He actually said, hey, these women traveled with them. They listened to them. They taught, They were with them. They understood. And they were used by them. They used their own resources, it says, to support <coughs> Jesus and the disciples. Okay? Now, so, I'm going to say, I think Mary Magdalene was rich. In order to travel with them and support them, out of them. she's the first one listed here. Uh, and uh, that, uh, and it says, 
uh, they contribute from their own resources to support Jesus and the disciples. Now, this gives new understanding also, I think, in the eighth chapter. Here it talks about Mary and Martha, remember, or maybe it's the next chapter, I'm not sure which. Uh, Mary and Martha, remember, uh, Jesus goes to their place and talk, or shares, and Martha is so busy with everything, and she uh, says, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. You know, we think, oh, Martha shouldn't be uh, so upset about it. Uh, I'm not so sure that I totally understand or under believe that. You know, and when the way Jesus talks to him is out, almost out of compassion, he says, you know, to her. But imagine you've got <coughs> Jesus, his 12 disciples, and a whole bunch of women and how many others come to this house. Okay, so it wasn't just 13 men. It was a whole bunch of other people too. And Martha says, how are we going to feed all these people? So, but these women traveled with them. They helped supply the needs and buy the food and other things. Okay? That's just a little aside. Like. So Mary traveled with Jesus and she listened to him. Listened to him and learned from him. Something that in that day and age, never was done. But Jesus broke through that whole scenario where women couldn't be taught. Okay, so point number four, this is where I really wanted to get to. Uh, Mary was at the crucifixion. We turn over to John, the 19th chapter, John 19. And down in verse uh, 25, now this talks about the crucifixion, going through all the things of the crucifixion. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Okay? I want to emphasize that. Mary was at the cross. Now, why did, why did she follow him? Why did she there? She was Jesus' mother. But why did she do it? I think she was so appreciative of what Jesus had done in her life. Cast out those demons, whatever they were, getting her free, that she, I, like I said, I think she was a rather rich lady. And she, I'm going to travel with Jesus. I'm going to help support him. Uh, he changed my life. And you know, that's what all of us, we actually see that Jesus has changed our life. We have such a gratitude towards him. We want to be with him. We want to travel with him. We want him to travel with us. You know, we want to get in church and worship him. We want to get in the word of God on a daily basis and see what he has to say. We want to spend some time in prayer. Well, that was Mary Magdalene. She is so appreciative of what Jesus did. She followed him all the way to the cross. Now, I want to stop there just a minute and think. At the cross, that's a terrible way of dying. It's a slow death. As you're hanging there, your life ebbing out. It's a bloody thing. He'd been beaten and uh, you know had a thorn, crown of thorns and all this. So he had blood all over the place. They're the person that you put your, all your hopes in. Who had changed your life so drastically. All of a sudden you see him dying on the cross. An evil, evil thing. Why was she there? Because she loved him and so appreciated him. You know, sometimes when we go through some rough times, we think, well, Jesus doesn't care, so you leave. No, he always cares. He loves us deeply. He really does. He loves us deeply. And he asked us to, in turn, love him back. And so Mary's standing there, and she sees what's happening. It had to be extremely hard to watch the one you love, you care for, who changed life, die such a cruel death. <coughs> then point number five, Jesus, or Mary was the first to the tomb. Next chapter, chapter 20, early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from its entrance. Thing is that, why was she there? She knew where they put him, where they laid him. 
she wanted to give him a proper burial. They didn't have time to give him a proper burial uh, before, but the first chance she did, which was Sunday morning, because you can't do anything on the Sabbath, on the Saturday, she had to be there. What did it say before? Well, it was still dark, Mary Magdalene got there. Uh, in Mark it says, uh, Mary, the mother of James and Salome also accompanied her. But they wanted to anoint Jesus. They wanted to do it right. There was no expectation whatsoever of the resurrection. Now, Jesus said, I'm going to rise up again. I'm being resurrected. But you know, a lot of times Jesus will tell us things and it never seems to compute. I think we've all had that where we've read something in the Bible and all of a sudden one day it computes. It, you say, oh, that's what it's saying. But until that time, we're not sure what it says. And a lot of us for the same thing, maybe for years or at least uh, you know, a long time, uh, we never really understood salvation. We never understood of following Jesus. We never understood what he's asking us. Uh, and so all of a sudden, a light goes on, a revelation we get, and we think, yeah, that's it. I want to serve that Jesus. So she's the first one there. Why? Because she loves him. She has no expectation whatsoever that he's going to rise from the dead. She loves him. She appreciates him. She's so thankful for what he did. Even though he died on the cross and she never expected that, she wanted to give him the right burial. So she was the first there at the tomb. The next verse uh, is point number six. Mary was the first evangelist. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. She was the first one to announce that the tomb was empty. She didn't understand everything, and sometimes we don't understand anything, but she knew what had happened. The body was gone. She was the first evangelist. She's the first one to proclaim that the tomb is empty. Then point number seven, it's simply very followed. Mary is the first to see Jesus, found in the 11th verse, where it says, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying, the angels asked. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned the leaves and saw someone standing there. It wasn't Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was a gardener. Sir, she said, if you take him away, tell me where you have put him, and I'll go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which means teacher from the Hebrew. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to my father, but go and find my brother to tell them I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. She's the first one at the tomb. She's the first one to go out and tell people it's empty. She's the first one to see Jesus. In other words, why did Jesus show her more than anybody else? I think because... She appreciated Jesus so much for what he had done in her life. She was always there. She was always there. She loved him. And she was always there. So if you really love Jesus and so appreciative of what he did in your life, guess what? God's going to bless you. God will bless you. He'll reveal himself in a whole new way to you. So that's Jesus that we serve. So on this resurrection day, they didn't realize what's happened. Even though Jesus said he was going to, we got it from this side where we can say, without a doubt, Jesus is alive. Now the question is, is he alive in our hearts and lives? Is he really alive? Or is it simply something in their head? Yeah, I believe he rose from the dead. How alive is he in your life? Is he living in your life? Or is it just something that you say, yeah, I come on Sunday morning and on Easter morning, resurrection morning, whatever you want to call it. I prefer resurrection. I don't like that term Easter, but sometimes we use it. The thing is that is he alive in your life? Is he living in your life? Is he real in your life? You may believe all this stuff, but he's got to be real. Really real. 
where he's alive and he speaks to you and talks to you and he loves you and you love him, where you worship him and praise him, where you get in the word and he speaks to you from the word. I'd say on this Resurrection Sunday morning, let's renew our dedication to him and thank him for being alive. So I just encourage you to repeat a prayer after me, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, Jesus I, come to you. I come to you. Father, I thank you, Father, I thank you. For, sending your son Jesus for sending your son Jesus to die for all my sins. Die for all my sins. I'm so appreciative of that. I'm so appreciative of that. But then you raised him, raised him from the dead. Then you raised him from the dead. I want to be raised from any dead things in my life. I recommit, re or maybe commit them for the first time, my life to you. I thank you, Jesus, for dying and for living. Oh, Lord Jesus, I look forward to the time when I can be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.